here. Let's jump in. So my name is Felix. Uh, the title of this talk is how to be a problem manager. Um, you know, I say PM product management really stands for problem manager. So I'm going to walk you through, um, you know, from my lens, how to be a problem manager. And it's important because, you know, not being a problem manager caused me a lot of headache uh, as a new PM. Uh, but before we get to that about me, bachelor's in computer engineering, uh, master's degree in business and 10 years in tech. Well, over 10 now, I think, actually, um, you can see I've worked at a, a few different companies, not too many. Um, I'm now at Google, uh, but I started my career at the NSA, at the Department of Defense, doing mobile development, uh, moved into a company called Sienna. Most people probably haven't heard of, but it's it's kind of the backbone of the Internet, um, all the hardware that that makes the Internet work, essentially. Um, and then I worked at Microsoft for some time. That's where me and IO met. So I'm honored to be here at TextGiving. Um, you know, finally got the call from my man IO to come in and uh, and do a talk. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here with you all. So thanks for joining me. And um, I'm a proud husband and father. I live here in Atlanta uh, with my two year old son and my wife. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just we're just excited to uh, to be to be here. So. Three questions every PM must answer. I'm saying it up front. This is the framework that I'm going to talk through in the end. Um, the three questions are what problem are we solving? Why are we solving it? And how do we measure success? It's really, really important that uh, as a product manager, you understand this framework because I think a lot of people get into PM thinking like, hey, I have a ton of ideas. I could improve the Facebook app or the Snapchat app or whatever app I use. I have ideas to improve it. And that's great. There are a lot of PMs that are very visionary. Um, I call them the, the idea person. Uh, me personally, I'm not the idea guy. Um, I like to focus on problem spaces and, and getting the team rallied around the right problem to solve. Um, but I think if you come in thinking that as a PM, you're going to have all the ideas and everyone's just going to do what you tell them to do, you're going to be <laughs> extremely disappointed. And so it's really important uh, that you understand that's really not the, the core of what product management work is. So I'm going I'm to explain to you a little bit why that's the case. And I'm going to start with a personal story of mine. So my first job as a PM, you know, I landed the gig. I'm so excited. I've you know, worked two years in business school and, and even a little bit of time before that, really prepping and trying to break in. And I get my first assignment. I go into my boss's office. He's like, hey. You know, we build this application for recruiters and we have a big problem right now because we have no analytics, no analytics capabilities. Recruiters care about analytics. They care about data and all our competitors have analytics. And so what happens is we go into these um, opportunities where we're trying to sell our product and they choose a different product because we don't have analytics. Um, the sales team is pissed, right? They're coming to the product team and they're saying, hey, build us some analytics features. So, Felix, I want you to do that. I'm excited. I'm like, holy crap, I have a problem to solve. It's important. You know, we're not close. We're not selling any product because we don't have analytics. I, you know, I have an important job. OK, let's do it. So being an engineer, I went straight to the data, right? Straight trying to figure out what's the data that recruiters care about. So I did a ton of research. I talked to recruiters that I've worked with in the past. I did research. I looked up uh, research studies that were done and I found out, you know, the core analytics and metrics that recruiters really care about. OK, great. Now I know what I need to build. Right. Let's go build it. Work with the designer to design um, what the analytics would look like. And and it was beautiful. Right. So we got the analytics. We got the beautiful interface, the, the dashboard. It's, it's awesome. Um, I work with the engineering team. You know, Microsoft fortunately owns a world class analytics platform, which is Power BI. So I work with the engineering team um, to get that built. And this is product management work. Right. You work with engineers, you work with designers, you do research, you, you figure out what to build and then you go execute. And so I was laser focused on building a world class analytics experience. Um, and, and so we did that. Right. We, we did that. Um, it took us about six months, uh, but we built it. We launched it. Um, you know, we started closing more deals. So the sales team came back and said, you know, this is great. People are actually buying the product now. They're, they're happy that we have analytics. Um, but why is this a failure story? Right. Well, it's a failure story because although we did sell more product and I did get a good review that year because I shipped some a feature that that worked. Only about 5% of our user base adopted the feature. And so for me, that was a personal failure because I'm like, I'm excited, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a new product manager. I'm going to launch a feature. It's going to be used by millions of people. Like that's what I'm thinking in my head. But then I'm, I'm looking at the data after we launched this feature and I'm like, wait a minute, 
why aren't people using it, right? In customer research, I heard people said they, they liked the, the, the feature, they liked what it could do, but people just weren't adopting it. So I started digging deeper. And I talked to one of my customers who actually was pretty excited about the product. And I said, hey, like, what, why do you think, um, you know, what's wrong with this? What could be better about it? And they said, well, you know, we love the feature. It looks great. It works awesome. It does exactly what you said it was going to do. But, you know, we really could have used maybe just a basic table, right? I built this beautiful dashboard that was interactive. And they're like, you know, we really could have just used a table. And I'm sitting there like a table. We took six months to build this beautiful dashboard. Are you tell me you want a table. But then I had to take a step back and realize, oh, wait a minute. That was my failure because here's the customer telling me that, oh, you took six months to build something. But I actually wanted something that was way simpler. So I had to try to figure out where did I go wrong in this process? And what turns out is it was actually the very beginning. I wasn't focused enough on the problem. My boss came to me and he described a problem. But if you listen carefully to what that problem was, we're not closing deals. The sales team is having a hard time closing deals because there's no analytics. That's not a customer problem. That's a sales team problem, right? So this was a very eye-opening experience for me because even though I did so many things right, I collaborated, I built a beautiful design, I did get some validation from customers, I didn't spend enough time understanding my customers. So as I started doing more research, this is what I learned. One of our customers says, you know, I'm a recruiter, I have to spend two hours uh, every two weeks to prepare a, um, a table and a, and a slide deck for my boss so she can review the hiring metrics and the pipelines. And I'm like, wait, you spent two hours doing this? Tell me more about it, right? And then I found out, well, I have to take all the information that's in your product, I have to download it or export it into Excel, which is a tool that Microsoft also owns. I export it into Excel. I you know, massage it into a way that it looks the way my manager expects it. And then I present it. And I spend a couple of hours doing this, you know, once a month, every two, every two weeks. And that just hurt my heart. I was like, wow, I have customers that are that are, you know, using all these workarounds that take them all this time. Um, and that was the failure. Right. I didn't solve the real customer problem. The real customer problem was not that, the, that we weren't closing deals. The real customer problem was it's too difficult to extract and manage the data in the system and then use it for you know this weekly report so anyway keep that in your mind as we walk through this framework but but that was that was the lesson i learned right focus on the customer problem and make sure you understand it very very clearly so now i'm going to walk you through a framework that can help you get to this position of really being a problem manager really owning the problem space and understanding what problem you're really trying to solve and build the right thing so and I mean, this is a lot less interactive than I want, but like, feel free to put more, you know, questions in the chat. I'll see if I can try to monitor and answer them along the way. But um, I, I want this to kind of be back and forth if possible. But, you know, th that's the start of it. Right. So so here it is. Here's the framework. What problem are we solving? This is where it starts. What problem are we solving? Why does it matter? There's two there's two kind of clear reasons it matters. Um, avoiding scope creep and creating clarity. So if you're new to product management, and you're not like too familiar. Basically, what happens is you go work with engineers. And if you don't give an engineers a very clear understanding of what it is they're trying to build, they could end up building something completely different than what you expect. Another thing that could happen is you work with a lot of different teams and every team has different goals. So as a PM, you might have another team come up to you and say, hey, I heard about this thing you're building. Could you maybe just add this extra feature for something that I care about? And what happens is if you don't have a clear understanding of, of the problem you're trying to solve, when somebody comes up to you and asks you to do extra work, you just kind of say, yeah, why not? That makes sense. That sounds reasonable. Right. But if you know the problem you're trying to solve, then you can clearly say, oh, wait, that's not solving the problem I'm trying to solve. We're going to you know, really focus the scope on the right problem and we're going to solve this problem and we can get to other problems later. Right. And again, of course, the other thing it does is create clarity. Like I was saying, if you don't tell uh, the engineers give them a clear picture of what it is they're trying to build, then they could end up building the wrong thing, right? So how, how what are some tips? How do you actually understand what problem you're solving? There's two things you really need to know. You need to know the customer and you need to know the problem space. On the customer side, there's user research, like what I talked about. I spoke to recruiters, right? I got in front of them. I asked them questions. I heard about their challenges. There's also product telemetry. So if you're new to product and new to PM, like every product you use, there's data being stored about the way you use it how often you open it, you know, what you're clicking on, any type of, um, you know, 
any type of success you have with that product, there's a lot of data that gets stored. Every time you click and tap around in the app on your phone or any product for that matter, um, that product managers use to understand usage. And so these things as a PM are gold because they help you really understand not just what customers are saying, but what they're doing with your product. And that helps you understand. So the other thing you want to know is know the problem space, right? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's never a good thing if you're a product manager and you're presenting an idea and somebody asks you a question that's related to it and you don't know the answer, right? Or you, you don't even know like that it's a question that you should know the answer to. And so knowing the broader problem space um, is really important. So let me give you an example. Within recruiting, there's something called analytics and there's also something called reporting. Now, when I was tasked to build an analytics solution, I learned pretty quickly that I, what I was actually building was a reporting tool, something that they could report on, you know, what um, what happened in the past with, with the recruiting process. How long did it take to hire people? How many people like made it through the interview phase, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a whole nother space within this kind of recruiting um, analytics, which is like real time analytics, really trying to do analysis on understanding like, you know, who's in the pipeline today? How long is it taking them to move through the pipeline? Um, how many opening positions, how many open positions do you have right now? Things like that. And so anyway, knowing the overall problem space really helped me because it really helped me narrow down what specifically I was trying to build. Am I building analytics? Am I building reporting? Which one is it and why? Right. Without that understanding, I could go into a meeting and say, yeah, we're building analytics. And I start talking and somebody says, oh, well, what about reporting? And I get confused Then I look bad. Right. So so know the customer, know the problem space. Let's jump to the second question. The second question, why are we solving it? So this matters because, you know, you're working with a team, right? Engineers don't have to listen to you, right? So engineers, and, and for that point, any of your other collaborators, they don't really have to listen to you. They don't report to you, right? There's, there's one thing you hear in product management often, like the PM is the CEO of the product. And I actually still like that metaphor. Some people don't like it because you're not a CEO. You don't have the authority. No one really reports to you. Um, but that's why it, helping people come along that journey and really understand why we should be solving this problem. That's what motivates them. That's what gets their buy-in, right? So, so this is really critical. Now, how do you do it? Well, two tips again, right? Bring data and use an example. So, you know, if you don't have data, you know, your, your product ideas, your strategy, it's really just an opinion, right? And so bringing that data is really important to kind of show people why this is important. And there's two types, right? You can have qualitative and quantitative. So you can have quantitative um, feedback, like, like real numbers, like, you know, 20% of our customers have this problem or 30% of our customers have this problem, whatever it might be. Or you can have qualitative, right? You get, maybe you have feedback mechanisms in your product where people leave a review or they, you know, report a bug or, you know, maybe you're just doing focus groups and you're asking people about your product. This is all qualitative. Now, it's really important to note that between these two types of data, I actually really love qualitative because that's usually where I find the most insights. The qualitative data where people actually explain why they feel a certain way, that's where you really get to the basis of, of what's important um, to them and what the problems are. The quantitative data, that helps you confirm that it's not just a single person having that issue. Right. So you can ask a, a question in an interview and someone says, oh, you know, I have a really hard time um, onboarding to your product. Right. Signing up, creating an account. It takes too much time. It's too hard. But that's just one person. But that's really good insight. But now what you can do is you can actually go to the quantitative side of it and you can look at the data for that product and you can see, OK, how many people enter our onboarding flow and how many people successfully complete it? Now, let's say you're looking at the data and you notice that, you know, a thousand people come into your onboarding flow every month and they never and like, you know, let's say 500 of them um, just kind of drop off. They never actually complete creating an account. Well, that quantitative data actually confirms to you that you probably do have a real problem in your onboarding, right? For your product, right? If a thousand people come in and 995 of them complete the, the onboarding process and create an account, well, then maybe that was just a one off of the of like a qualitative feedback, but it's not true of everybody. Right. So those are some things you can think about. And the next thing, this is my favorite tip, actually, in the whole presentation. Use an example. I can't tell you how many times I've been trying to describe to a team, you know, 
why a problem is important. And they're kind of like they're not in their head. They kind of understand it. But you see the light bulbs go off when you use an example. Right. Um, one example of that is kind of what I said about the recruiter. Right. It's one thing to say, oh, you know, recruiters need analytics and it's important to them. It's another thing to say. Imagine recruiter uh, Kim. Right. Imagine Kim is a recruiter. She works at a mid-sized tech company. She hires, uh, you know, 30 people a year. And she has to give a presentation once a month to her boss. And she spends two hours every two weeks downloading data, scrubbing data, preparing a presentation. Two hours every two weeks. Um, and this is a big time suck on her day, right? She could be talking to, to, to applicants. She could be reviewing resumes or interview feedback. Um, and so, so now, right, when I, when I give you that, like that person has a name, the user has a name, Kim, you can really start to empathize with Kim. You can start to imagine Kim hiring 30 people a year, but spending two hours every two weeks preparing a spreadsheet, right? And you can imagine how that's not really a good use of her time. Um, so use an example, right? You, I, I, I mean, I can't tell you like this literally in a, in a, if I'm writing a document, if I'm giving a presentation, I almost always have a slide where it's like, this is a user. I give them a name um, and I kind of just show people like this is the journey. This is what they go through. Right. So that's a really um, important tip. All right. How y'all feeling? How are we doing? I mean, I think we're 15 minutes or so in. I got one more um, one more question to this framework and we'll go through some examples and then we can open it up to Q&A. Um, but yeah, just just shout out in the comments. Uh, is, is this helpful? Is this, you know, is there anything uh, you know anything else I can add or any questions you have? Please let me know. All right, the last question: How do we measure success? Man, I said the last tip was like my favorite. Actually, that tip of, about using a story is my favorite example. Um, it, it's my favorite tip in the whole presentation. But how do we measure success? Um, this is just something that really is is uh, important to me because I remember when I was at Microsoft, man, there was this one senior engineer. And um, two times in a row, I made this mistake. I got into a, a meeting with him and other engineers and I was describing what we're trying to build. And I get all the way to the end of the presentation and I give him an example and I'm you know, excited. I'm talking about the impact we're going to have. And he just raises his hand. And he asks the question, how, we do, how do we measure success? And the first time he did it, I was like, man, that's a good question. And I had the answer. I just didn't think to include it in my framing. Um, but I, I had an answer and I started talking him through and he's like, OK, great. I just wanted to know. But I did it twice and it, it, I will never forget it now because, like I, like I said, I made that mistake two times in a row. And it's like I won't make it again. But imagine I'm about to imagine I say, hey, y'all, we're about to play a new game. What's one of the first questions you're going to ask about this game? Right. You're probably going to ask, OK, how do we play? But soon after that, you're probably going to ask, how do we win? Right. You're probably going to want to know, how do I win this game? How does somebody win? When is it over? Right. And that's because when you have a group of people going after a goal or trying to accomplish something, they, they want to know what does success look like. Right. They, they want to know because it, it helps them really understand what they're aiming for. If you don't give them that, then they're kind of just like, oh, what, what are we going after? What are we trying to accomplish here? Right. And so how you measure success is important because it creates that shared vision. Right. If you want a group of people that don't report to you to go in the same direction, you got to give them a shared vision of what success looks like. And it also enables iteration, right? You set some goals, you try to achieve them. Even if you don't meet them, you can iterate, you can improve over time, right? So it's really, really critical. How do we measure success? Now this one, I don't have two tips, but I have three principles, right? When I think about success or measuring success, I kind of have another simple framework that I use that usually gets me good coverage on the most important success metrics, right? So engagement, satisfaction, and effectiveness. Basically asking three simple questions about your users when you launch a feature. Are they using it, <laughs> right? Do they like it? And is it working? Now, engagement and satisfaction are relatively straightforward. Effectiveness is one of the most difficult ones because it's nuanced for every single feature you launch, every product you launch. But engagement, are they using it, right? You want to look at, I'm oh, sorry. Um, sorry. You want to look at the data, the product data, right? Are you seeing that adoption? Remember engagement, like I said, when I launched that feature, I'm looking at the data and I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, only 5% of our users are actually trying out this new feature. What's going on there, right? So you, you want to set a, a goal for that, right? What's success look like? In this situation, 
success for me for a recruiting app would have been, you know, 75, maybe, maybe 75% of our users use the feature, some, something much more substantial. But, you know, I didn't think about that ahead of time. So I had no way to work backwards from it. Right. But if I think about that ahead of time, then I really have to think through, okay, does 75% of my user base really care about this feature? Um, would they really be able to use it? Satisfaction. Do they like it? You have to think about how are you going to know whether or not users like it? A lot of times, um, you know, maybe there's some in game, uh, some in game, I mean, a, a in game, a in product feedback. Um, you know, like you see like a, a star rating pop up when you're using an app that happens. So you look at that data, you start to understand, like, do people like it? You may also have to do things like, um, you know, do interviews with people just to get their feedback after you've launched. And then finally, is it working? This is the nuanced thing. So you really have to go back to the very beginning of this framework where we ask, what problem are we solving? And then you have to start thinking about what signals do I have that will prove to me that it is working, right? And so what does that look like? Well, that looks like you have a problem you're trying to solve. Maybe, uh, let's, let's use recruiting analytics. So let's say recruiting. Let's say analytics, the problem you're trying to solve is you know, they have to give this weekly report or a biweekly report every two weeks. So they need a dashboard to measure that and make decisions and try to improve their processes. So one signal you might try to use um, for effectiveness is like, well, one frequency of use or repeat visits, right? If they're using this thing, um, if they're using this to make decisions to improve their process, well, then you want proof that they're coming back over and over again, right? So repeat use usage is maybe one signal you might look at to see, is it working? Another thing that's even more maybe tangible is maybe you can look at the data in the system and you can start to see, okay, how long does it typically take them to hire somebody? Let's say it's 60 days. And then you launch this analytics feature and you know they're supposed to be using it to improve their process to hire people faster. Well, maybe you can look at the data over time and see is the average time it takes for them to hire somebody actually going down as their usage of this feature goes up, right? So these are the types of things. And, and you, maybe you can start to understand why this is very nuanced and challenging uh, because you really have to deeply understand like what the problem is and then what signals you have in your product that prove that that problem is being solved. So anyway, that's my simple framework. You know, three questions every product manager must answer in order to be a problem manager. You really have to know what problem we're solving. You know, understand the user, the problem space. You have to understand why are we why uh, are we solving it? And you got to bring data, use an example to make it really clear for your team why you're solving that problem. And then three, you really have to think ahead of time. What does success look like? So you're giving your team something to aim for. And within measuring success you know, three categories of, of success uh, measures that I typically use are engagement, satisfaction, and effectiveness. So with that, I think we have a little over 15 minutes left in the session. I see, I think, one question. Um, so I can definitely address that. Um, but in the meantime, um, you know, before we, before we get to the Q&A, I just want to share, I am on LinkedIn. I share insights about PM in my career um, on my hashtag Felix Chats. I'm also on Twitter. Felix Watson Jr. You can scan that QR code to find my LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to connect with you all. So please reach out. Uh, if there's any way I can help, let me know. And um, yeah, let's, let's get to some questions. So let's see. Kevin says, can you talk about the different roles in PM? Product design, product strategy, PM versus PO, and as what PM is not slash why PM is not for you if you're XYZ for Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, definitely. Okay, so within product, right? So within product, you do have product designers. There are product strategy teams. Your, your product design teams are usually, you know, your UI, UX folks, right? So they're the ones that, that you know, push the pixels, I guess, is, is one way. So they, they you know, they set up um, the actual user interface, what it looks like. But they also do something that's way, way more important, which is the UX, which is like the interaction, the user experience. Now, this is kind of where I think designers really shine. Like, I think a lot of people look at designers as, oh, they make things look pretty. Uh, but UX brings a lot of expertise with human psychology, uh, behavior, understanding, like, you know, what users, uh, what, you know, what types of flows are, are frictionless or, or help users kind of accomplish a task. So they bring a lot of expertise in that area. Um, and so that's why you, you want to lean on your designers a lot as a PM, uh, especially if you don't have a background in like human centered design or things like that. Um, 
other things. So product strategy, there's usually a, a product strategy department and they really think um, kind of further out. They're more uh, external facing. So as a product manager, you're actually more of an internal, usually more of an internal stakeholder, right? You're working with the internal engineering team, the designers, the, the project managers, uh, the data scientists. You're working with that internal team most of the time. Now you can and you should be talking to your customers frequently, but a lot of your work is internal. Um, strategy, though, they're going to be more outward looking. They're going to be looking at the market. They're going to be looking at trends. They're going to be trying to help assess, um, you know, what are the biggest strategic threats to our product and where should we be investing over time? Um, so that role is a little more. Uh, it's a little less about building things and it's a little more about establishing kind of frameworks, thought leadership, um, insights into the market and, and what, you, what your what your product team really should be doing. Now, um, PM, now I think, you know, one of the things if you, if you PM versus PO, a product owner is another role, it's like related, um, but they typically manage backlogs. Um, they'll work with the engineer, engineering team more on execution, whereas a PM does a little bit more of the strategy piece, especially when you're uh, more senior. You do a lot more of the strategy piece, figuring out what problems we should solve, um, setting the vision, setting the direction. You know, you may have a five year vision for your product where you're trying to head and a roadmap of how you want to execute over time. Now, a PO will take that roadmap and you know translate it into a backlog and work with the team to kind of execute. Um, me, I've personally never had the benefit of having a product owner. So I kind of feel like at a lot of big tech companies, PM and PO is kind of merged into one. Um, and then uh, what PM is for you or not for you? I think PM, some of the key things for PM, you have to be collaborative um, if you don't like working with other people not for you. If you want to be kind of the, if you want to have a lot of authority, like, you know, what you say, people just kind of do inherently because, you know, you're the person that owns like the product. That's not the case. I mean, I think a lot as a product manager, people look to you to make decisions, but the truth is it takes a lot of convincing. It takes a lot of, um, uh, influence to really, to really get your ideas out there. Um, what are the best practices to use for prioritizing requirements in order to create a well-defined MVP? All right. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. So yeah, when it comes to prioritization, like I love the rice framework as far as prioritizing, but what you're talking about with an MVP is super critical, man. Um, and to be honest, I don't have a good framework for creating an MVP. Um, but I guess I have a mental model. Yeah, I guess I kind of do have a framework. So I think, there's a really great graphic too that talks about MVPs and it basically says like, you know, the MVP, you get all the features that help you validate the core value prop of your product, right? So I think the best practice is to think about what is the core value of this product? What are people trying to accomplish? And then what is the minimum feature set to actually validate that you have a working solution, right? And a lot of times an MVP might be completely low tech. Like my favorite thing as far as best practice is your first MVP, there should be no code at all, right? You should be able to try to do your MVP completely, you know, with either no code tools or maybe even offline. Um, I'll give you an example. I started a company which was a travel recommendation uh, company when I was in business school. We built this app. We got to like 500 users. It failed like 99% of businesses do. Uh, but it was a great experience and I learned a lot. But one of the core things I learned was really focusing on the core value prop of your product. So we did some things right, though. Our very first MVP for this travel recommendation platform was actually a Google map. Right. And so what we did was we had this vision that you would be able to find interesting places to visit that were not tourist traps, that were not recommended by TripAdvisor or Yelp, things like that by talking to people that are local to that city, right? And so we had this idea where we basically help you exchange advice with friends that you know that are from a city or have been to a city before. But instead of just building an app and trying to get people on it and, and build this network from ground up, we started with a very simple MVP, which was do people value um, these kind of niche, niche recommendations that aren't tourist traps? So what did we do? We built a Google map, um, uh, travel itinerary, basically. So it was a Google, Google map with a bunch of pins that were labeled A through E or whatever, however many locations we had. And we actually sold <laughs> copies of this Google map with, um, with pins for recommended locations and, a, and an itinerary. 
Um, we sold them for like five bucks each. Um, and that was our proof, right? Once we saw that people were willing to pay for this type of advice, we're like, okay, there's something here. But that was our MVP, right? We didn't need uh, messaging capabilities so people could talk back and forth. We didn't need, uh, you know, adding friends and building a network. We didn't even need an app, right? We just needed something to prove that people actually wanted what we were going to try to sell, right? So, so anyway, so that's what I say is like best practice. Um, okay, I see some people may also be posting in the Q and A. So let me jump over to there real quick. How do I pivot into product management? Background is technical marketing engineer and software engineer. I wrote PMs. How do I? How can an experienced program manager transition to product management? Actually, um, okay. How can someone transition into project management from a common manager role? Uh -huh. Hands on experience want to qualify for a job or best practice use product. Okay, we talked about that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Y'all got some good questions. Okay. So to tackle the piece about transitioning into product, I think there's like several people asking a question that's kind of similar, getting into product. So regardless of your background, um, you know, some of the best things you can do to get into product management. One, the most common way people do is through internal transfer. So if you work with PMs, um, what you want to be doing is you want to try to shadow those PMs. You want to ask them if you can help them on top of your day job. You want to try to help them with any tools they do. Maybe go on customer interviews with them, help review uh, requirement documents, help with testing. Um, you know, anything you can do, just try to be helpful and shadow PMs so you can learn from them what they really do in their day to day and, and um, get an insight into what your transferable skills are that will help you tell the story. Right. So that's what you're after. The second thing is. You want to go seek out people who've done the same thing, right? So when I wanted to break into PM, I was an engineer uh, for about five years. I stalked people on LinkedIn that I saw that had an engineering background that got into PM. And I noticed that they had this MBA in common, like a lot of people did an MBA. So that's that was the route I took. Now, that's not required, um, but that's what you want to do. You want to find people that have been in your role and have made the pivot and you want to reach out to them, right? And the goal is to reach out to as many of these people as possible on LinkedIn. Um, knowing that you won't get 100% response rate, right? And so my rule is always, I reach out to people at least three times. I call it the three by five rule. I reach out at least three times with five business days in between. So build that network of people that have done what you're trying to do and get advice from them. That's like kind of core. The next thing you can do is start a side project or try to get some volunteer experience as a PM. So as a side project, you can literally build anything to help people. It doesn't even necessarily have to be like a, a app or a software product. It could be a blog. It could be, um, you know, writing content on LinkedIn. It could be, uh, you know, a, a club or a group. Um, you know, I know some folks who started a product management club at their undergrad university as a way to kind of build some of those skills. And really, like, think about this presentation. The core of it is not like actually writing code or building software. The core of it is what problem are you solving? Why are you solving it? How did you? How do you measure success? If you can do a side project answering those three questions and then getting an interview and kind of articulate how you did those things, I guarantee you, you'll start to get a lot of uh, positive re reactions from people like, oh, yeah, this person gets it. This is what PMs do. Right. Um, so that's the thing. And then the other thing is, like I said, get some volunteer experience. So a good tip that I hear time and time again, um, one of my friends, he did it through nonprofits. So there's a ton of nonprofits out there that need help, especially if you have a technical background. They likely often don't have that. Um, and so you can come in and find out what types of problems they have and what types of ways you can, um, what types of ways you can help them solve those problems, um, as, as, as thinking like a product manager, right? Um, let's see what, uh, oh man, you guys are asking some good questions. Um, I don't even think I'm gonna be able to get to all of these courses. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good courses out there. Product School has a lot of free um, kind of videos and material, I think, um, that you can use to kind of to kind of beef up your skills. But again, the truth is, like, courses don't really um, build the skill. Really getting out there and doing it, starting a side project, some volunteer work, those are really the ways you build those skills. The courses will give you just some understanding, will help you understand the vocabulary. Um, so from that perspective, you know, Product School is good. Um, there's a lot of other ones. Um, there's also uh, the Inclusive Product Management Accelerator, which I would be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, so if you're interested in a, a, a program that can help you, um, let me see if I can. 
post this right here. Um, share this. That's our inclusive product manager. Oh, wait, did I just do that? Oh, I forgot to share my whole screen. Anyway, so this is the website where you can sign up, but you guys don't need to look at that right now. But I just sent the um, I just sent the uh, the link in the chat. Um, that's another resource that I helped start. Uh, IO is actually a uh, mentor in that program. Um, and we, we're helping folks who are, it's really geared at folks who are like already really deep into product management learning and have maybe landed an interview or are having trouble kind of getting through the interview. So I think um, that is a good thing. Somebody asked when's the next bootcamp open up. So we do have these cohorts. Um, the next one, we actually just wrapped up application. So it's going to start um, in January, but we're going to have one every quarter, right? So this one um, is uh, is starting in January. It's about 10 weeks. And then the next one will probably start in like March or so. Um, let's see. What other questions can I answer? We got four more minutes. Um, did I put that in the wrong? I think I put that in the wrong place. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Pain points as a PM, yeah. Oh, rice, yeah, the rice framework. Yep, you guys got it. Um, what else? <laughs> Is it easy to get fired from these types of positions that probably work on fail? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think every culture, every company has a different kind of firing culture. Um, some have more than others. From my experience, most of these companies, though, once you're in, you're kind of in. <laughs> it's kind of sad to say, but the truth is products fail all the time. Um, you know, I personally saw four different products get killed in my first role at Microsoft. Um, and so, you know, I definitely didn't get fired for it. I think, I think leadership actually tends to get the brunt of, you know, the the issues when a, when a product fails. Um, I think you can usually only get fired if you're just like not doing the work, right? If you're if you're not doing the work or you know the team feels like you're not kind of adding value, that can be a problem. But you know, you're rewarded based on the outcomes, but I haven't seen many people get fired because their product wasn't that successful, unless they were like, you know, the senior leader that like <laughs> that uh supported launching it or something. Um the inclusive product management accelerator is restricted to people with work authorization in the US. Um, so that that is the, the kind of restriction there. Um, pain points as a PM. I mean, it, it's uh, pain points as a PM. I think one of the hardest things is kind of just the product, the project management side. As I mentioned, I've had a lot. I haven't had like the benefit of working with a product owner. Um, working at Google is actually my first time having like program managers that kind of do a little bit more of the project management side. Um, so I think one of the pain points is, is, is that like there's a lot of kind of keeping like timeline straight and and entering information in like Jira or some kind of tracking tool. And that's like my least favorite part. So I just don't enjoy that work. Um, so that's one of the pain points. The other pain point I would say is um, really just the balance between tactical work and strategic work. There's always a lot of tactical work you can do um, as far as, um, you know, writing requirements or responding to emails like i have a hundred like i don't know over 100 unread emails right now like there's always that tactical stuff to do but as a pm you really have to be focused on the problems you're solving you know the vision the strategy and so it's sometimes it's hard to like find the right balance uh, because there are things that have to get done but a lot of the real value is created in some of these more strategic efforts so that can be sometimes challenging um okay maybe two more questions before we wrap up Hands-on experience, I think I already addressed that as far as volunteering, um, helping other um, product managers internally at your company. What are some of the best practices to manage the quality of requirements product, especially when multiple stakeholders are involved in design? Require That's interesting. Quality of requirements. Hmm. I mean, I think really when it comes to requirements, the biggest thing for me is getting it in writing and then getting feedback, right? I think early on as a product manager, I felt like I had to have all the answers. And now that I've come to Google, 
um, I think I've learned that that's actually not the case. As a PM, really your job is to kind of bring together a lot of information and help drive good decisions. So when you want to write requirements, you, you get them written down because like talking about requirements is never clear enough. They have to be written down so people can understand them. And then you just invite people to comment. And sometimes it can be hard because when people leave a comment on something you've written or some work you've done, you feel like it's an attack on like you. But it's really not. It's just how everyone is working together to try to get the clarity and the right level of, of quality um, in the requirements. So I think that is the best practice. The, the best practice literally is write them down as fast as possible and share them with as many people as you can. And it's a lot of work, right? Because every time you share them, you're going to get feedback and you might have to change it. You might have to update it. Um, but, but that is literally for me, like the best practice, like don't try to cook up requirements in a vacuum and like make them perfect before you share them. Write them down as rough, as raw as possible. And then get them out to people and get feedback. Um, but anyway, with that, we are actually a minute over on this session. Uh, thank you so much. It looks like we did get a healthy group of people chiming in. I'll hang out for a little while. Um, I like just around if people want to ping me or, or chat at all. Um, and I also I'll drop my beacons link. Um, in this chat as well which will give you more ways to um, interact with me. So if you want to you know, book time with me or you want to uh, join my community um, on LinkedIn or Clubhouse or anything like that, you'll find links here um, on my Beacons link. So yeah, thank you so much for spending some time with me and uh, hope to see you around uh, and uh, you know, hope to connect with you on LinkedIn.